What's up everybody and welcome to part two of my Naive Base Explained series. In the previous video we have covered how the Naive uh, Base algorithm uh, works and in this video we're going to cover some more additional points about the algorithm. Namely we're going to cover what's naive about Naive Base, then how to handle the problem of uh, rare values, then how to continue uh, how to handle continuous features and lastly then classification versus regression. So let's start with what's naive about naive base. Therefore let's look again at this slide from the previous video. So here we were only uh, we were currently only considering the features sex and passenger class and we were looking at test passenger free. And what we want to do here is we want to estimate how many of those 549 non-survivors we would expect to have the same combination of values as test passenger free. Therefore, we simply multiplied the 50% with 50% with this 50% and then uh, with 549. And it's exactly in this calculation where the naive of naive base comes into play. Namely, by multiplying together those two probabilities here, we made the implicit assumption that those two events here, that the sex is female and passenger class is one, are independent of each other. Or more generally speaking, we made the assumption that the features uh, sex and passenger class are independent of each other. So what does this mean? It means that those features here don't influence each other. So for example, if we uh, only look at those 81 uh, female non-survivors, non-survivors instead of looking at all the non-survivors we would expect to see that the values of the passenger class are distributed in the same way as they are for the all the non-survivors so we would expect that those eight, uh, out of those 81 female non-survivors also 15 percent travel in the first class 18 in the second and 68 in the third class and the other way is also uh, the other way around is also true Namely, if you look at only those 80 non-survivors who travel in the first class, then we would expect that 15% of those are female and 85% of those are male. So now let's check if that is really the case. Namely, since we are currently only looking at the two features, uh, sex and passenger class, we can actually look up what those uh, probabilities look like. So let's do that. So let's start with uh, those 81 uh, female non-survivors. So let's see how they are dis distributed across the different passenger classes. So if we look that up, then we can see that uh, compared to all the non-survivors, uh, non-survivors who are female uh, are less likely to travel in first and second class and they are more likely to travel in the third class. So now let's do it the other way around. So let's only look at those 80 non-survivors who travel in the first class. And here we can see that uh, compared to the odd non-survivors, non-survivors who travel in first class are less likely to be female and more likely to be male. So from those two comparisons, we can see that uh, the feature sex and passenger class uh, are not really independent of each other. So they influence, uh, influence each other. So with respect to uh, the non-survivors, what we see is that, is that there seems to be a negative correlation between being female and traveling in first class. So if a non-survivor is female, then it seems like that the, the passenger is less likely to travel uh, in the first class compared to all the non-survivors. Or if the non-survivor travels in first class, then the passenger seems to be less likely uh, to be female compared to all the non-survivors. And this kind of observation basically applies to every data set, not just the Titanic data set. Namely, there are always some features that are in some way correlated to each other. So then uh, making the assumption for our naive base approach that all the features of a data set are independent of each other is an extreme uh, oversimplification of the real world. You could even say that this is a very naive assumption. So that's why naive base is called naive. So now, uh, just as a side note, uh, 
let's see what happens if we actually don't make that naive assumption. Namely, in that case, we couldn't make use of the multiplication rule for independent events, but instead we would need to use the general multiplication rule. So here what we do is uh, to calculate the probability that A and B happen, we can either pro uh, calculate, uh, multiply the probability of A with the probability of B given A, or we can also do it the other way around. We can multiply the probability of B uh, with the probability of A given B. Okay, so now uh, let's actually use this general multiplication rule approach for making our estimates here. So we're going to make use of these new probabilities here. And as you can see, there are actually two ways in which we can do those calculations. Calculations. So let's start with the first one. So we're going to multiply the probability uh, that a non-survivor is female with the probability that a non-survivor travels in first class given that uh, the that a, a non-survivor is female. So and here I've actually written down those probabilities as fractions. So then if we use those uh, probabilities, then we can see that we get an estimate of three. And if we do it the other way around, so if you multiply this 50% with this 4%, then we again get the result of three. So then uh, since we are currently looking only at uh, two features, we can actually look up how many uh, combinations there actually are. Uh, in our train data and as you can see there are actually three uh, passengers uh, three non-survivors that are uh, female and travel in first class in our train data so now you might be tempted to think that this uh, general multiplication rule approach is the better approach because here we've actually calculated that number of three whereas with our previous approach naive base approach we had the result of 12.4. However, uh, we can't really do that. Namely, there's a serious problem with this approach here, and that's uh, these new probabilities that we've here determined. Namely, uh, in order to determine those, we actually have to know how many passengers there are in our train data that, that are uh, female and travel in the first class. So we actually have to uh, look up a specific combination in our training data and as we've seen in the previous video this lookup approach might work when we're only considering two features but again then when we consider all the features of a data set uh, this doesn't work anymore and we then wouldn't simply have uh, zero examples of a specific combination so this probability would then be zero as well as this one and then our estimate again would be zero so then again we would have here two zeros and we wouldn't be able to make a prediction. So that means after all, uh, we actually have to make that naive assumption. Otherwise we couldn't calculate any estimates here. Okay, so that's why a naive base is called naive or that's what's naive about naive base. And now let's get to the second point here, namely how to handle the problem of rare values and actually there are two ways in which uh, rare values can cause problems to see the first one let's look at the feature uh, parents and children so what can you see here is that the majority of passengers traveled with uh, zero one or two children and everything above that doesn't really happen that often so for example if we look here at value three here we can see that there are in total just five passengers that traveled with three parents or children. So this would be then an example of a rare value. However, with this value, there's actually no problem. Namely, uh, there are just uh, low percentages. But if we look at uh, value four here, then we can see that there are in total that there are in total four passengers. So the total number is similar to this value uh, of three here. But the problem is that all those passengers just belong to one class, namely not survive. So we have zero passengers or zero survivors that traveled with four parents and children. And that's exactly where the problem lies. Namely, if a test passenger here uh, happens to travel with four 
uh, parents or children. For example, here, test passenger five travels with four parents or children. Then in this case, we're always going to predict that this passenger did not survive. And that's because here yeah, in this calculation, there is a zero, a zero. So since we are multiplying here numbers together, our estimate uh, for the survivors is always going to be uh, zero. So in a sense, uh, the probabilities of those other uh, features here, they don't really matter in this calculation. Even, even if they would be uh, very high, which might indicate that a passenger actually uh, survived. So for example, uh, if you look here at test passenger 5, then we can see, if we just look at the sex and the passenger class, then we can see that uh, this passenger has the same values as test passenger 3 here. And if you remember back to the previous video, where we just considered those two, feature, two features to explain how the naive base algorithm works, we had uh, these estimations here for the uh, combination of values for test passenger 3. So we had an 88% chance that this passenger uh, survived. So if we just look at those two features here uh, for test passenger 5, then we might actually think uh, that this passenger here survived. So let's see if that's uh, if that really happened. And as you can see here, this passenger passenger actually did survive. But as I just said, we were never going to predict that this passenger survived simply because uh, that passenger traveled with four parents or children. So how do we now get around this problem? Well, the probably simplest way is to just uh, add one instance to each entry here. This way then we don't have the problem that there are probabilities of zero. And if I just toggle back and forth here, you also see that those other percentages here, uh, they don't change that much. And that's because we are only adding one instance. So overall the estimations shouldn't therefore then uh, change that much. So now let's see uh, what our estimates are here after we've made the small change here. So if we do that then, then we can see now that we have, uh, that we will predict that this passenger has survived and the probability is actually also pretty high with 80%. So in this case then we would make uh, the correct prediction. So that's the first way in which rare values can cause problems. The second thing that can happen is that a rare value only occurs in the test set. So for example here, if you look at test passenger 6 here, this passenger traveled with uh, 9 parents or children. And if you look at here at our table, we can see that we actually don't have this value in our table. So uh, in the training data, we didn't have any example that traveled with 9 uh, parents or children. And the problem then with that is obviously that we don't have a probability here. So we actually can't uh, complete our calculation here in the second step of the algorithm where we create our estimates here. So how do we solve that problem? Well, the simplest approach is to just, in this case, then ignore this feature. If we do that, then we get here a 90% chance that the passenger did not survive. So let's see if that's the case. And indeed, the passenger did not survive, so that prediction would be correct. So that's the second thing that can happen with rare values. Here, however, I have to say that this is just my opinion of how to handle it. Namely, I didn't really found anything about that into uh, in the literature, so take this adv advice with a grain of salt. However, my reasoning for this approach is that since this uh, value here is so rare that it only occurs in the test set, it's probably not predictive, uh, not predictive in the first place. So we might as well just ignore it. Okay, so now we've covered the second point here, how to handle the problem of rare values. So now let's get to the third one, namely how to handle uh, continuous features. The algorithm that we've covered actually can't uh, handle continuous features. And that's because by definition, a continuous features has an infinite or theoretically an infinite number of different values. So what would then happen here in this first step of the algorithm is 
that for example those 549 uh, non-survivors would be spread across an infinite number of different values. So therefore then obviously uh, most uh, of these values here or most of the probabilities here then would be zero because there are no examples. So what then happens is then if we make our prediction here in the second step of the algorithm, it is very likely that there is at least uh, one zero uh, in this calculation. So again, then we would run into the problem that both of our estimates here are zero and therefore then we couldn't make any uh, prediction. Now, in reality, obviously, uh, a continuous feature doesn't really have infinite many values, but generally continuous feature have an uh, unusually high number of different values. So what that would happen is that those 549 non-survivors would be spread across uh, a high number of different values. So at the very minimum, we would again run into the problem uh, of rare values. Okay, so that's the problem with continuous features. So now how do we handle it? Namely, it is uh, pretty straightforward. Namely, we can simply transform a continuous feature into a categorical feature by creating uh, bins. For example, uh, in the original data set, uh, the one from Kaggle, there wasn't a feature called uh, age group. In the original data set, this was just uh, called age. And there the age was given in years. So based on that, then uh, I created those uh, bins here, so to say, say, so those age groups where uh, a child is or has the age between 0 and 12, teenager between 13 and 19, uh, then the adult everything above 19, and if the age wasn't given, I just uh, created the group uh, unknown. So if you then uh, create those bins out of the continuous feature, then you can make sure that uh, not one bin has a probability of zero. So that's how we can handle the continuous features. So now let's get to the last point, which is classification versus regression. And the other thing is that our naive base approach that we have covered can't actually be used uh, for regression. So we can only use it for classification. And that's because uh, for regression, uh, the label is continuous. So theoretically what could happen is then that the label can, could take on an infinite number, uh, an infinite number of different uh, values or classes in this case. So we would run into the, or into a similar problem as we've, as we've just seen with the continuous features. So for example, if we look only at the female passengers in our training data, then we can see that there are in total 314 and what would then happen is those 314 female passengers would be spread across an infinite amount of different classes. So therefore accordingly then most of the classes would contain uh, zero examples and therefore then most of the probabilities here for value of female would be uh, zero. And the same kind of logic applies uh, to every other value that we have. So when we create this table here in the first step of the algorithm, uh, the great majority of the probabilities, probabilities that we get here will be zero. So when we then make our, uh, want to make our estimates here in the second step, then it is very likely that there is at least one uh, zero in those calculations here. So again, we would run into a problem that we only get a zero for all those estimates. And therefore then we couldn't make uh, a prediction. So that's why a naive base or this naive based uh, algorithm that we've covered can only be used for classification and not regression. So with that now we have reached, we've covered this last point here. So we have reached the end of this video. So thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in one of my next videos.